So my name is Orgi Alitz from Mellanox, and I'll talk today about storage application performance boost with zero trashing network stack. Uh, what would the motivation for this uh, performance study that we did is um, something that has to do with NVMe over TCP. Uh, NVMe over TCP is an NVMe over Fabrics protocol that um, was discussed in this conference last year and also in this year will be a few sessions of that. And uh, we noted that the overhead related to copy uh, is something you can easily see, which uh, covers, um, takes lots of, uh, of the CPU uh, cycles of the protocol. And this actually has larger impact. Um, that was the, uh, something we wanted to check if indeed this has larger impact on smart NIC system on a chip systems, which tend to have more limited caching and memory systems. Uh, caching and memory systems. Uh, and the idea in this work was to apply some of the new APIs that were introduced in Linux in the last year for zero copy uh, to optimize the, the, uh, this workload in an environment of Smartnik, which does NVMe emulation. And I will elaborate on that later. Um, First, I'd like to go uh, over, over the uh, models that, um, the general models that could be used for uh, TCP uh, based zero copy. It can be applied actually to uh, any socket uh, application, also for instance, UDP, but the focus here was uh, TCP. So on the transmission side, how would a typical zero copy workload would look like? Um, the application buffer has to be pinned for the time of the transmit plus, plus acknowledgement. And after this uh, stuff is done, the, uh, the system, the stack, has to provide some sort of buffer reclaim notification to the application so they know they can reuse their buffers. This typically does not require special NIC uh, hardware assistant. On the receive side, um, generally we can say there are two models. On the first model, the driver packet is provided to the application, plus a way for the application to recycle buffers after they use them. In the second model, the application buffer is given to the driver for packet receiving. This typically does require uh, some hardware assistance from the NIC. For model number one, um, what one needs typically is a header data split, also called HDS. And in the second model, some sort of direct data placements or DDP is needed. Our present, my presentation today will focus on transmit uh, zero copy. Um, but I will now briefly also sketch uh, for both sides, both receive and transmit, what do we have in Linux? So for transmit, the sent message system call was extended with a flag called message zero copy. It was done it was a work by Google and William De Bruyne in kernel 414 and was presented in NetDev 2.1. On the receive side, also from Google and Eric Dumazet on kernel 418, MAP support for socket, which is model number one. Uh, and this will be presented in this conference. Continuing uh, in our, um, in the past to what we were focused in this work, I would like to, um, talk about what are the different layering options for NVMe over TCP. So NVMe over TCP is a driver, which we can think of also in our application for zero copy in this uh, performance study. So we have the NVMe TCP driver, which is layered on top of the TCP stack, and then the NIC driver. We have, generally speaking, three options. In the first one, everyone is in the kernel, both the driver, and the TCP stack and the NIC driver. This is more or less the more um, historical or conventional um, setup for a storage stack all in the kernel. And this uses internal sockets. Uh, the sockets um, that um, are widely used on user space application also have a kernel counterpart, which are less known, but are work for many, many years, typically in the storage space. The second option is a combined one. We have a user space NVMe TCP driver that uses sockets. And when getting into the kernel, goes to the TCP stack and NIC driver. The third option, which might be um, less common, but or uh, more uh, less common, 
is the one we are using in our work where everybody's in user space. The NVMe TCP driver, the TCP stack, and the NIC driver. So uh, this TCP stack has to be um, API or interchanged by a socket offload technique. I'll elaborate in a minute on that. And the NIC driver can be either, this, the user space NIC driver can be either part of this TCP stack or um, based on DPDK. For this work, we used um, storage stack, which is called SPDK, the Storage Performance Development Kit. It's a storage stack, all user space, uh, that was reduced in the last uh, four years by Intel. And it's an open source, high performance scalable, fully a uh, user mode stack. And for the socket, uh, for the TCP stack in user space, we used uh, a package from Mellanox called VMA, which is Mellanox Messaging Accelerator. It's an open source, Socket of library that allowed non-modified applications uh, written over socket API to run from user space with a full kernel and network stack bypass. And this is uses uh, something called LD preload. It's a way to um, load the symbols of this library into the uh, space of the, of the application process. And then all the calls of these applications to conventional socket system calls are hooked into this library. It's a standard way to do this stuff. And this way, the application is not modified. So uh, looking in what we are, the workload we actually came to optimize um, is something called NVMe emulation. It's a technique or a technology or a product by Mellanox called Snap, but NVMe emulation is something that start, we start to see from multiple vendors. On the left-hand side, we see a server, a Linux server, can be bare metal server that none of our software runs on it. And this server tends to be x86, but it can be any server. It has an emulated NVMe, NVMe PCI disk. And then what I call here snap hardware uh, is the hardware that we are using to um, create this emulation for the disk. I called here snap hardware and it's beyond the scope of this uh, presentation. And after the emulation is done, the question comes, what would be the backend protocol? How this how this emulated NVMe disk traffic will go uh, to the fabric, assuming the actual disk is not on the SOC. In this case, we have an environment where the fabric traffic has to be NVMe over TCP. So how does this work? After the emulation, this NVMe Suki or NVMe traffic somehow gets into the system on a chip. In the Mellanox case, our, our smart NIC is called Bluefield. Um, and it can be Bluefield 1, Bluefield 2, and so on. Uh, we have received this traffic in something I would call here a snap daemon, and then our business for today starts. We have SPDK initiator interacting with the VMA socket offload library, and then it, go it goes over the, the network with NVMe over TCP, and then we are interchanging with a remote target, which can be on x86 server or whatever, uh, NVMe over TCP target. And the point where I implemented zero copy is exactly in this um, uh, linking between SPDK TCP initiator to VMA. This is a place where we uh, deployed the TCP uh, zero copy. Um, the TCP uh, zero copy. What we will see today, we will see, um, when we will see results, some of the results were obtained by only running this initiator by some synthetic benchmark that runs on the SOC. And then we have also a result from running the full, the full pass when we run some application on the server over the emulated PCI, uh, NVMe PCI disk. It goes to the snap daemon, to the SPDK, and to the target. So what are the layers that are related to this work? The layers that relate to this work are the one in the middle, in the yellow brackets. Uh, but just for a context, on, from above, we have either the SPDK perf, which is the benchmark, or the NVMe emulation. We call it proxy, because we kind of proxy NVMe, emulated NVMe PCI to NVMe TCP. And in the middle, we have SPDK. The SPDK is a storage stack, so it has a block, uh, is a, it has a block layer, and then NVMe layer, and then a specific NVMe TCP layer. And then below that, we have the VMA, which uh, the VMA library has both the TCP IP stack and the NIC driver for MLX5. And below that, we have the hardware. 
So all this is, um, is a single process, but I kind of sketch the different layers of software. Before uh, going into the actual um, uh, details of what uh, we did here, what were results and uh, some sort of performance discussion, I would like to go into the, uh, a bit into the details of the Linux TX0 copy API. Uh, this will serve me to later present the changes or the assumptions that we had. So the workflow for applications to use Linux TX0 copy um, is made of four, four steps. The first is, is a discovery. The application can realize by a get so opt system call if zero copy is actually supported. The second is a set so opt, which is just a general usage declaration. Applications that want the socket provider to use it later, they have to declare it. But the actual usage is per system call, per send message system call, optionally. It, has, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. After you did the declaration, optionally, you can say on a given system call, uh, provide the zero copy flag. And please note, it's important that this, send, this system call gets an IO vector. So message header is actually an IO vector, which spans multiple disjoint buffers. In the example of NVMe TCP initiator, some of these buffer may be protocol headers, what's called in NVMe TCP PDU headers. Other ones can be data buffers. Um, now comes the last part, which is the, the most uh, involved one is the buffer reclaim notification. We said that uh, the socket provider has to, uh, has to, um, they will have to hand this buffer to the hardware. So they would need to somehow register and pin it. Uh, and then when they are done with the buffer, they should provide some notification to the application that they know that they can reuse the buffer. So the way it works is via the socket, the socket arrow queue. And then the deal is that both the application and the stack, they maintain an invocation ID counter, which is incremented per system call invocation, start from zero. And then the notifications are provided in the form of a range, a closed range between low to high, let's say six to 11, which means six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, and so on. Range of acknowledged IOV buffer IDs. So it's an ID that represent a, a set of buffers. Uh, and this is the agreement between the, the, the application to the stack, uh, both to increment the counter and the stack provide the notifications. Um, now starting to dive into our actual environment, when we come to this, this zero copy performance data, data we uh, took two points of the protocol and we actually uh, adjusted them to optimize the performance. The first has to do with the zero copy buffer pinning. So we wanted to amortize the cost of doing pinning and unpinning for every system call. And the idea was that uh, was made from two building blocks. The first is that in SPDK, DPDK social packages, there is a the concept of DMA buffers. DMA buffers are typically huge page based. So we wanted to make sure first that all the traffic used by this application, that this NVMe TCP uh, initiator is originate from DMA buffers. So we had to do some patch for that. And the second one, everything is made of uh, huge pages, uh, buffers that reside within huge pages. We did a hardware registration cache in the socket provider layer. So when the socket provider layer, they see a buffer, they quickly mask it to the base of this huge page size and they, and they look in their cache. If they have a heat for registration, they use the uh, registration. If not, they register and put it in a cache. This way, the cost of uh, pinning and pinning is amortized. The second has to do with the buffer reclaim notifications. So uh, this buffer uh, reclaim notification, they, uh, they actually add some overhead to the application and they can even cause some slowdown uh, due to over complexity in the state machine and waiting for those notification. So the idea here was that NVMe TCP protocol like Virtual, uh, maybe every or almost all storage protocols is transactional. So on the initial side, we initiate a transaction, we, met, we, we pass the data and then we get a response. By the time we get a response, we can be sure that the traffic arrived to the target. So we can actually simply skip those notifications uh, and correct it will, will remain. One, one bit to handle here is to think of the case of, of lost acknowledgement. So we send, it, we send the data to the target. The target sent us an acknowledgement, but this acknowledgement was lost. 
So it's theoretically possible that the local stack will try to retransmit this buffer again. But even if this happens, there are two points to note here. First, the stack has read-only access to this buffer because it's transmit. And the second one is that this buffer is safely reside, this, this buffer safely re resides in addressable memory because use pages in Linux are practically pinned. So overall, we are safe and we, um, uh, and we could uh, do this uh, trick. So to sum up, and it's important, for this performance study, we used a pin down cache at the socket provider, provider layer for the buffer pinning, and we skipped zero copy buffer reclaim notifications. The implementation itself was not something to too, too much elaborate on. In the, in the SPDK, it was trivial because we skipped the notifications. So we only had to do uh, a patch that makes sure that everyone uses DMA memory, both the protocol header and the data buffers. And of course, use the flag for the send message call and also the get sock opt and set sock opt and so on. Uh, in the VMA library, it was missed changes around the place because you take a TCP stack, uh, it's a compact one, but still, and you want to uh, have these stacks know how to work. TCP stacks tend to do lots of copies, so you have to modify them uh, at least when this flag is provided, not to do any copies in their older flows. And we added also the huge page uh, based registration cache for zero copy buffers. Regarding the testing setup, before I go into the results, I'll say a few words. So um, the, the software on the initiator on the SmartNIC was SPDK 1907. This work has been actually done last, uh, last autumn, uh, even before Corona time. Um, and um, so it's SPDK 1907, VMA, whatever, plus those patches. And the SmartNIC rat, runs uh, seven, CentOS 76. The SmartNIC itself, was Bluefield 1, 100, uh, 100 gig megabits. In this specific instance, we have few few models. This specific instance has 16 A7 ARM um, ACs in two calls at 800 megahertz. And the target details, the target was a remote uh, x86 node with those details. It's not a bottleneck and it's not um, uh, it's not something to, to focus on. It was a it was a null backing store because we wanted to just to see the improvement in the network protocol. Um, what were the results and the raw the, the workloads and the raw results? The first one is a benchmark, as I said, SPDK perf that we run it from the SOC. We do, of course do a route, be, a write because it's a TX0 copy with a QDX of 64. And then we had two workloads. In the first one, we varied the number of calls between 1, 2, and 15. By the way, we stopped at 15 because in this implementation, VMA stack needs uh, one core for their TCP progress rate. Okay, that's why we, we could use for the application only 15 cores. In the other case, we, uh, we were running on the full number of cores, but we were varied the IO size between 512 five, bytes to 4K. And um, what were the results? For one call, the non-zero copy gave us a baseline number of 85, 85K core IOPS, and zero copy has a few tens percentages of improvement for 120K. In the 15 call, we got a very surprising results. So we got about 100% improvement for 65K to 1.2 to 1 million. Just to note, the golden number in this configuration for, if you do the mass for four kilobytes over a 100 gig link, you need to get to 2.7 million IOPS. So even with this experiment, we're only um, almost halfway. Um, a much more interesting result was for the full emulation when we run the traffic from the host through the emulated uh, NVMe uh, PCI, through the snap and everything. So here again, we got a 100% improvement for 500K IOPS to 1 million IOPS, um, which is a bit of impressive. And now we have to try and understand, so how come uh, we got there? Um, let's see some graphs before diving into the results. So here in this graph, we see how scalability goes. So the baseline here, the orange one is referred to as TSO. It's, uh, uh, it's the baseline of the code that does also TSO. And then the, the black one is TSO plus zero copy. We, we can see that for zero copy, uh, the, the increase in IOPS is pretty much linear. Whereas for the non-zero copy, after eight calls, scalability stops. Uh, for the latency, 
we see that uh, the orange one has also a linear increase in latency, more or less, after four calls. And the, the black, the zero copy, has some increase in latency, but it's much more moderate. The absolute number for the latency are uh, a bit of high here. Uh, this is due to queuing effects because the QDEPS we were testing with was 64. So we see here numbers for QDEPS of 64. The second graph is on 15 cores. And now we take a uh, few IO sizes starting from 512 bytes to 4K. We can see that for the non-zero copy, the drop in performance is linear. For the zero copy, the drop is more uh, moderate and same for the increase in latency for both options. Now, um, when coming to try and realize uh, or analyzing the, the results we get, and even during the work, uh, people typ typically do, and, and so, so did us, running perf and getting flame graphs for the CPU cycles. So what we see here, we see the non-zero copy. The first is the distribution for one call, and then the distribution for uh, 15 calls. We can see that the, there's a notable copy cost um, which uh, actually uh, increases, not dramatically, but it increases from uh, one call to 15 call, the cost of copy increase. In the zero copy case, uh, we, eliminated the, we eliminated the copy and the cost is also eliminated. And we have new bottleneck or new battles to, to fight beyond the scope of this uh, work. Now, and here comes the kind of the heart of my presentation. <laughs> So what made zero copy so much efficient? We tried to look into that. What we did, we, we looked on various low level statistics. Some you can get from Perf, some we had to take from a hardware monitor, uh, hardware uh, a monster driver. So um, if we look on caching, which is the focus of this uh, work. So uh, typically has system uh, has um, uh, uh, L1, L2 and last level cache, at least three levels of caches. The first cache, in our SOC, but also many other system is very small and uh, it tends to be uh, occupied by local variables and not much bit beyond that. The second cache uh, has, to ha has typically the software context or the metadata for the, for the, for the transactions. Uh, this has some relevancy, but uh, in storage workload, less relevancy than it would have um, on uh, packet processing workload because in packet processing workload, you can have 100 or 200 million packets per second. So each packet carries their metadata. And it's really important to have this in L2 cache at least. Uh, where in storage, you, the order of transactions is let's say 1 million, 2 million, 5 million. So um, it's less of a um, of critical aspect to this um, to storage workloads, in my opinion. The last cache is, is, uh, is critical in our SOC and maybe also in others. So uh, the data, uh, the, the, the access to, that, to, that, to data, which is in the last level cache versus access to data, which is, is the DRAM, is, uh, has a big uh, difference. And it, uh, it, it matters a lot for performance. Another measurement of statistics, which is commonly used in this field of performance analysis is IPC, instruction per cycle. So, um, Processors attempt to run instructions, and if this instruction has to load something into memory, from memory, excuse me, and the memory, uh, and then you have to go from to L1 cache, to L2, L3 cache, and to the DRAM. So this would, at some point, the processor will be stalled for half a part of the time and wait for the data to arrive. So uh, instruction per cycle is a number which is, uh, it's convenient to think about it between zero to one, like zero, we are totally ineffective, and one, we are fully effective. But in modern system, it can go a bit over one. But let us not uh, let it to confuse us. Let's think about it between a number between zero to one, one to ten, one to two. This is uh, in IO application. This is the best number I think we can get. And this single number is typically a very good indication for efficiency. So many times when you saw something performance, they will ask you what was your RPC, or you can see IPC comparisons. We also looked on the instruction per I.O. and cycles per I.O. So when we put those uh, numbers into a table uh, and we had it in front of us, we can see that when we are on one call, both workloads, the non-zero copy and the zero copy, they started IPC of one, a bit of more. 
And uh, we can see the difference in the structure per IO cost, because this is the cost of the copy, you know, the whatever 20, 30 percent that we that we have there. But what happens that we go to 15 calls, we see that the IPC for the zero for the non-zero co copy kind of collapse and, and drops to one half. So it's a hundred percent decrease from one to uh, or whatever uh, percent from one to, to half of that. And if we look on the last level cash hits, we can see that uh, we are only at point, point 0.60 uh, hits on the last level cash. And then what happens is that uh, we have many last level cash cash misses, IPC decreases. We can see that uh, we have now 70K cycles per IO and it just doesn't scale. So our, our, um, our main conclusion from this whole performance study is that copy has a notable system-wise cost. And this system-wise cost is something you can just not read from uh, Cycles Flame Graph. It's not gonna tell you that. Only when you uh, start to look on the, on the combination of uh, last level cash hits or whatever uh, payments, you measure somehow the, how frequency you go to last level cash or how frequency you go beyond last level cash actually to, to the DRAM. And what does this do to your IPC? You 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 uh, you realize that the um, the the, the cycles per IO become so much high, and then uh, it didn't scale anymore. Um, before concluding, I would like to do a, a, a short sketch of the of uh, what's going on in open source for TSTX zero copy and uh, suggestions for some further work. So what is the, the state of the union, at least what I was able to gather for TX open source uh, in Linux. So it merged to Google RPC and actually also to SPDK since this work has been done in January this year. Um, um, a cool work by the Intel guys. Um, we also had, had the chance to participate a bit. So in the target side, uh, zero copy is there and it provided a nice performance boost for both uh, x86 systems and ARM system. Now, a uh, few uh, suggesting or thoughts about further work. The first is, I think we should investigate ways to avoid the, uh, the, the cost of per IO, per IO per buffer doing a pin and pin. Uh, something in the kernel that, get, that which is called get put user pages. So um, hopefully we can use the recently introduced IO Uring API that was used maybe a year or in the last year or last two years in Linux to actually make uh, an initial declaration towards the socket provider on buffers that we want to pin. And later there will, not, there will not be any more pinning and unpinning. This is, uh, can be a critical effect. Uh, the second uh, nice uh, and uh, low hanging fruit uh, that could help applications is to actually extend send M message. Send M message is like send M, like send message, but sending M IOVs or M buffers. So this way, application would be still be able to do one system call that provides the socket provider, uh, gives the socket provider a bunch of buffers, so they don't have to do a system call per buffer, but they would, they would be able to provide a hint per buffer if they want zero copy or don't want zero copy. The last one is see if and where we can relax and refine the buffer reclaim notification overhead. Uh, in our case, we had a transactional application and we just skipped it all together. Um, we, can, we should see if this can be across the place. Is it correct that every transactional application can do that? Are there more cases? So it points to third. To conclude, uh, what are the takeaways uh, from uh, this performance study? Um, our SOCs and maybe more SOCs uh, can be sensitive to last level cache misses. And if there are many cache, uh, last level cache misses, it has a system effect. Um, in this case, the, when scaling, the improvement in IOPS so from zero copy goes beyond the CPU cycles you would see uh, for flame graphs. If we, if we, and we do assume some, some symmetry between receive and transmit in networking applications, uh, this study showed that we got a very nice boost from transmit zero copy and same uh, or similar, or we expect for to happen for receive zero copy. 
for similar storage applications. And the uh, zero trashing network stack has critical role for Smartnik SLCs. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Paul. Um, okay, I, <clears throat> we're still behind, but there's not that many questions. Uh, so you're saying now we have open source projects that use uh, zero copy. I just want to correct what I said. Yes, I updated the slide. So SPDK right. in the January 220, they used it in, uh, and get with a great success, not over Mellanox VMA. They tested it. It's the Intel team. They tested it. Uh, it's nice they test it with Melanox NIC, but they test it with uh, kernel sockets and they got uh, um, nice improvement. And of okay. course, Google RPC is also there. Uh, this is what th these are the two packages that I was able to, to find in my uh, search. Uh, okay. All right, so to the questions. First one is from Shrijit. Uh, Shrijit, you want to talk or you want me to repeat this? Uh, Actually, okay. it's already covered. You can skip it's, all of my questions. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll jump then to all the way to Ian Forbes. Did I get that right? That's the last person after you. Uh, um, has anyone looked at using receive a message to process application as, and message RQ data in the same Cisco? I'm not familiar with that. I have a message where you, is, you, you can batch, I think, uh, in one socket called multiple messages. You're not familiar with it, okay. No. Uh, uh, did I miss some question? Okay, the rest of us should use questions. All right, maybe I'll ask one more. I know we are behind a little bit. Okay, so somebody just popped up. You wanna ask? Uh, no, that's Sagi, okay. Uh, does it make sense? To, so, so I can see where zero copy makes a lot of sense for bulk type transfers, yeah? But when you say gRPC has support for it, uh, does it make sense in that case? Because if you're having some small transactional type messaging. So that was also when they, um, I, I don't know exactly how it works in gRPC, if there's a threshold or not threshold, but um, at least in the SPDK community, when they when they um, when they adapted zero copy, so it's not it's without any threshold. So uh, currently, uh, it's across the place. That was their client design decision. But I can uh -huh. see cases where uh, if you really know what we are doing and what is going on beyond your legs, so you can decide uh, you can decide a threshold or um, as I said. The, um, Protocol headers like a 40 bytes. Why you want to do zero copy for 40 bytes? So today it's it's uh, be, today you, you don't want to do a system call per per buffer. So you, you 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 on the one hand you want to use the IOV. On the other hand, so uh, this extension that actually William De Bruin suggested to me uh, last year uh, of send M message could serve uh, protocols that want to do uh, do it in a more granular man manner. 